Okay. Um, before I get on with my testimony, I want to tell you the devil has really been after me the last three days because this is the first time I actually wrote down, wrote, wrote my testimony out. Uh, only because I've seen it on the other tapes. I wrote it out and I thought it was a great idea. I uh, usually go. He's really uh, been after me. I mean, if you can see my jaw is swollen, I have a toothache. And it started the day I started writing this. And last night I couldn't sleep, so I was so st too stupid to understand the fact that I will do whatever it takes to get the God's word out. So, uh, hi, my name is Mark, and I am a true believer of our Lord Jesus Christ. I suffer from an addictive personality. If I like something, whether it's good to me or bad for me, I pretty much want more of it. I am also recovering from anger, rejection, self-worth, isolation, drugs, alcohol, and the number one issue is the right. I was born in 1957. My mother had me when she was 17, my dad was 20 and in the Air Force at the time. After having three children, they divorced in 1962. I was five, my brother was four, and my sister was two. A few months later, my mother remarried, and this was the beginning of the physical and mental abuse that I would have to endure for the next five years of my life. My stepfather was not and Because of this, he could not keep a job. We moved around a lot. In my first grade year, I attended eight different schools, and two of them I attended twice. Imagine everyone's surprise when I got held back a year. The abuse by my stepfather began shortly after he moved in with us. He would whip my bare bottom with a belt, then have me stand in the corner while everyone else had supper. Then without eating, he would send me to bed. This would occur a lot to me, um, but not as much to my brother and sister. Years later, I asked my mom why he hated me so much. She told me it was because I looked and acted a lot like my father. At one time, my father and stepfather raced stock cars against each other. That's how they knew each other. I had a problem with wetting the bed when I was growing up. My stepfather would punish me in one of two ways. He would always whip me with, a wet, with my wet clothes on. Then he would either make me stand in the corner until school started. Then without allowing me to clean up, he would send me to school. Needless to say, I became isolated. I didn't have the other way he would punish me after the beating would be to handcuff me to my bed, cover the windows with moving blankets so I couldn't tell if it was daylight or dark, and then leave me there until the next morning. I would not be allowed to eat or go to the bathroom during these times. A few years later, I was found to have a medical condition that would not allow my bladder to enter empty properly. By the time I started first grade again, my stepbrother, who was the same age as I was, and my stepsister, who was the same age as my brother, they had moved in with us. The children didn't get to eat until the adults were done. My grandfather Staten used to tell a story about when he come, he and grandma came over to visit my brother, sister, and I on Thanksgiving. All the adults were sitting around the table, the turkey and all the fixings were gone. And ever at uh, another table, the children were having hot dogs, all except me. I was standing in the corner. You see, I would sneak around the house at night to find something to eat. In pictures that were taken of me and my brother during these years, it looks as if we were from a third world country. You could count every rib on our body. As you can see, I don't miss many meals now. <laughs> anyway, that Thanksgiving Eve happened to be the night I got caught uh, uh, taking the, the food. 
I had found two large uh, gumdrops. Those the big ones that they have out there. Um, my stepfather had sliced them in half and put hot red pepper flakes in one, and in the other he had put horseradish and set them on the counter. Needless to say, there was no denying who had been sneaking food. I got very sick. My punishment was a hot butter knife on the palms of both of my hands. A beating and standing in the corner until bedtime with no food. My grandparents cut my sentence short that day. They took my siblings and out for dinner. My stepfather had told me that if anyone asked about my hands, I was to say that I fell against the radiator heater. And if, it did, did, and if I didn't say that, I would be punished for lying. Because my grandfather did ask me. And I did tell him I fell against the radiator. There was one time that a $50 bill came up missing. After rounding up all the children, the question was, standing us all in the corner for what seemed like hours, my stepfather concluded that the only one that could have taken it was me. How he came to that conclusion is still on. My stepfather then began to spank me with an old hot water hose, the kind that had the thick wire around it. He gave me a whack for every dollar that was taken, then took a break and gave me 54 before, 50 more for my punishment. I know it was 50 because I had to count every single one of them. Right before I went to bed, my mother found the $50 bill. And instead of apologizing to me, my stepfather told my mother that I should have convinced him I didn't take it. Folks, I was on the table. This kind of abuse would last until I was 10. One day, through a set of events that happened to me at my school, the police and a child welfare person came to our house and took me away to live with my real father. As I was leaving the house, I told my stepfather that when I get old enough, I would be back to kill him. And I meant it. Back in the 60s, no one cared enough about child abuse or domestic abuse, so nothing was ever done to my stepfather. Through junior high and high school, I lived with my dad and my stepmother, who were good parents, and they didn't deserve what I put them through. I did drugs drank alcohol, and was sexually active by the time I was 11 years old. I was a very angry teenager, and I would fight in a heartbeat. I was a letterman in football, basketball, baseball, and track, and I would be safe to say that I was thrown out of more games than anyone else in the history because of my temper. The referees hated me. <laughs> I'd always argue with them. In my adult years, I became worse. I hated every man on the planet and loved every woman. I never would hit a woman or a child. I believe it was because of those five years of abuse seeing my mother beaten and scared to help me. I didn't get into a fight. If I did get in a fight on a weekend, I thought I had a bad weekend. I was known to carry a baseball bat and I never hesitated to use it. I was so so I was also very revengeful. When I turned 18, I went to kill my stepfather. My grandfather found out. He had called the base where I was at. He wished me happy birthday. And then told me something to leave. On my way. Leave. And then he found out I was coming to his aid. And he knew what it was coming. And my whole family knew the story. Of me wanting to kill my stepfather. My grandfather stopped. He wouldn't let me on this side. 
And I still believe today that was the grace of God stepping in right there. Before I go on, I, I do want to say that throughout my whole life, I believe God was there when I didn't even know who he was. Because he said, I should be dead. With my health, with the things that happened throughout my life, I should be dead. But yet I'm not. And God has made me made me a powerful man towards Satan. I, I, I'll fight him in a heartbeat. And I believe God has kept me that way. He had a reason. When I had a club, a man pulled a knife on me. I was walking out the door. It was over a pack of cigarettes that my date supposedly stole from him. I didn't know he had done this until a friend told me that he stopped him and told him that he better leave and not come around for a while. In fact, the friend that stopped him was a defense attacker from the Cleveland Brown. One time to the police. Play my clock easily. He said, That's the problem. He said, I have to kill him. And he won't stop. And that's the way I go. I'm glad he was on my side. <laughs> the man left town that night, and I didn't see him again until eight months later when he came by my house by mistake. I saw him across the street and I ran across the street with my baseball bat. I beat the living crap out of him. I'm not proud of those things, but that's the way I was. And I took his two bags of groceries that he had. I didn't even let him have his groceries. I put him in the hospital for several days. My family was so scared of me that they would meet me in their yards and wouldn't allow me in their house. My stepfather would call his family and friends to come over to his garage when I would come to visit my mother. Because he knew I meant what I had said. There were many more events like this up until I was 34 years old. I was put in a halfway house for recovering drug addicts. The very first night, I took, I took one of the counselors and put him up against the wall and told him, I'm only here. Because I don't have a place to stay. They could have threw me out, but then God was there. They kept me in the, in the halfway house. I had tried to commit suicide twice because I believed I was worthless and had no true friends. I started going to NA and AA meetings and went through the same 12 steps that are used in Celebrate Recovery. The difference between the 12-step program of AA and NA is that God is very seldom discussed in your, repo in your recovery plan. Whereas God is the recovery plan in Celebrate Recovery. He is the recovery plan. Starting with the Beatitudes of Matthew 5. I was clean about seven years before I found God. And in those years, I still had a lot of anger, low self-esteem, and still was hanging out with the same people I had hung out with when I was using. The only difference, I wasn't using. Going to AA and NA meetings and working in 12 steps with my sponsor kept me um, from using, but I was still worthless. 13 years ago, I walked into a church and accepted Christ into my life, which is a whole other testimony in itself. Maybe someday you all get to hear that word. <laughs> that was freaky. Since then, I became a new creature, like it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17. I've made Christ not just my Savior, but He's my Lord. There is much more I can tell you about my life before Christ came into it and after He became the sinner. I need to wrap this up, so I'll tell you one more thing that happened after I found God. God has taught me many lessons and gave me many things to write and speak on. But the most important lesson he taught me was that I am to love everyone. 
and have no unforgiveness in my way. Just as Jesus taught us in Matthew 18 and in many other stories in the Bible on forgiveness. See, I have since talked to my stepfather and asked for his forgiveness. I didn't go there expecting him to ask me for my forgiveness. I already have forgiven Two weeks later, my stepfather gave his life to Christ. When I asked my mother what brought him to the altar, she told me that all he could talk about was the way that Christ had changed me and he wanted what I had. Today, he is a new creature also. Last year, Royce, without knowing much about my my wife, Sandy, asked us to be leaders for Celebrate Recovery. We have been blessed by it ever since. It has given me a chance to help others through teaching in the step study books and others in our small groups. From step four to step twelve, it is all about forgiving and asking for forgiveness. It is not an easy journey. And by no means do I want you to think I'm sure of my hurts, hang ups, and habits. I am far from it. I used to be ashamed of my life, but with God's help, my sponsor, my accountability partner, and now the Celebrate Recovery Program, I'll still be fighting, but now I'll be fighting for God. If you are suffering from any hurts, hanging up so happily in your life, I want to invite you to our small group. Men will be in the youth room here, women will be in the fellowship Celebrate Recovery will change your life. I've been clean almost 20 years. No, the last year has been in celebrating recovery, and I have seen a big change even in myself. But what I've seen it do for people is amazing. What God has used celebrate recovery for, the way He's taken them and changed their lives. That's better than any NA or AA program I've been in. I encourage everyone to go to Celebrate Recovery. You do not have to be a drug alcoholic. You don't have to be just an overeater. You can just be anxious all the time, procrastinating. Any, anything that you do in your normal day life, Celebrate Recovery can help you get through that. Because you can't sit, sit there and tell me that everybody that we meet or see, or even in our churches, that they're all okay. There's something in their life that they need help with. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're a 20 year clean that drug addict. I still need to work my 12 steps, even today. I still have some issues, and I will always have issues, because I won't be perfect. Celebrate Recovery isn't trying to get you to be perfect. Celebrate Recovery is trying to help you keep from hurting, which is more important than anything. That's why Christ took the stripes for us. That's why He died on the cross, to help keep us from hurting. He don't want to see us suffer. He doesn't want to see us hurt. But we as humans, we don't, we don't see those things. Everything, my health is, I have very bad health. But you know what? What Christ went through is nothing for me, and what I've, my health is nothing to what he what compared to what he went through in just in just a couple of days. Mine will never match that. All the adding on mine up to be able to walk down the streets barefooted, with broken glass, with a three hundred pound cross on your, on your back, people spitting on you, and yelling. Calling your names. But yet, while he was up there on that cross, he looked up to his father and says, Forgive.
forgive them. But they have no clue what's going on. I want to thank you. You all that are here tonight. And by the way, my stepfather did ask me, or did accept my asking for forgiveness. And today, I'm honored to call him my dad. Thank you.